Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. From the heartland to the Big Easy, we share the stories of Americans making an impact. We'll follow the money from the grocery store to the farm to find out what's causing inflation. And we head down to New Orleans, where they're preserving the work of a legendary street artist years after Hurricane Katrina. Now to one Midwest town with a roundabout way of making its roads safer and helping the environment. Chris Van Cleve has more. Indianapolis may be the Circle City, but 30 minutes north, a community is really sending drivers for a loop. Round and round we go. Yeah. Carmel, Indiana is home to 142 roundabouts and counting more than any other city in the U.S., something Mayor James Brainerd says makes the city safer and greener. Is it buggy that we're stopped at a light? Yes. Two cars were going through the center section. A roundabout would have moved uh, 30 cars through in the same amount of time. By 2025, this community of more than 100,000 will be a one stoplight town. We don't have to pave over paradise. We can keep our roads more narrow, and, and that's better for the environment. It's better for pedestrians. The circular intersections typically have one or two lanes. While they slow vehicles down, the roundabouts actually flow more traffic, allowing Carmel to remove vehicle lanes even as its population more than quadrupled. I call it a road diet. We're able to add a bike lane, add a beautiful median with trees and flowers down the middle, but we're moving 8% more traffic per hour. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety found the switch to roundabouts cut injury crashes by nearly half. And on busy intersections, like coming off a highway, injury crashes dropped 84%, while total crashes plummeted 63%. As traffic fatalities continue to rise in the U.S., we really need to be using all of the tools in our toolbox, and roundabouts are one of those tools that we've seen to be effective. They also create green spaces, allowing for civic art displays. This one was named International Roundabout of the Year in 2016. And by eliminating idling at traffic lights, Carmel's roundabouts remove the equivalent of 5,000 cars worth of carbon dioxide, while saving drivers an estimated $14 million a year in gas, says former city engineer Michael McBride. If roundabouts work so well, why are they not everywhere in the U.S.? <laughs> That's a really great question. I still get asked, why roundabouts? You know, is that some kind of Carmel gimmick? People still really don't understand that safety benefit. Nationally, there are about 7,900 roundabouts. New York and Virginia now require they be considered as an alternative. There is a bit of a learning curve to the roundabout. As you approach the circle, slow down. Remember to look left. Don't forget to yield. And when you see an opening, just go. Around here, folks say that's roundabout right. We now turn our attention to revolutionary technology. A tiny implant could help people who are paralyzed communicate using only their thoughts. Dr. John LaPook shows us the device and speaks to a patient who says it changed his life. At his home in Melbourne, Australia, 62-year-old Philip O'Keefe struggles to do the simple things many of us take for granted. Getting dressed, washing myself, um, cleaning my teeth, feeding myself, all those things are severely restricted. ALS took away his ability to control his hands and body. When you heard that there was a device that could use your thoughts to operate a mouse, what did you think? I laughed. I thought, this is science fiction type stuff. But it's not the realm of science fiction anymore. In April of 2020, O'Keefe became one of the first patients to receive a Stentrode brain-computer interface implant. This is the Stentrode. That's the device that goes inside the blood vessel. Dr. Tom Oxley, CEO of New York City-based Synchron, leads the development of the device. We've figured out how to deliver the sensors into the brain without open brain surgery. That's the huge advance here. Inserted through the jugular vein, the device is implanted in the area of the brain that controls movement. Signals captured by a receiver in the chest are sent wirelessly to a device that decodes thoughts into commands for a digital device. The clinical study that we're running is purely for digital device control 
for people whose hands no longer control digital devices. O'Keefe demonstrated his computer skills by writing me this note. His thoughts focused on a mouse clicking letter by letter. The technology has the potential to help a range of patients whose bodies are unable to receive messages from the brain. Good morning, I'm banking. Um, I can store my emails. I can surf the web. I can do most things that you can do using your hands to regain that independence. Can you imagine a time in the future when we can beam how we are feeling to somebody else? Yes, I do think that brain-computer interfaces eventually go into that realm, but uh, that's a long way away. Clinical trials are continuing, and so far, five people have received the implant, including one in New York City. This gave me the reason to keep on living. But two years ago, I would have gone, oh, what's the point? But now... I'm involved in this, and it's just been the most exciting two years of my life. And that, to Philip O'Keefe, is mind-boggling. After the break, we follow a single food item through the supply chain to find out where prices are going up along the way. Down on the farm, we investigate the source of inflation. Grocery prices have risen over 13% in the past year, the largest increase since March 1979. Tony DeCopel got a taste of how inflation works by tracking a gallon of milk from the store back to the cow itself. There's one word that can sum up a trip to the grocery store these days. Obnoxious. <laughs> the prices? Yes. Inside the DND market in Delhi in southeastern Pennsylvania, just about everything is costing more. And that's most certainly true down aisle one in the dairy section. Prices are up for whole milk, 2%, fat free. Everything is. All of it. Everything. Shalish Patel that, is the owner. So how much more does a gallon of milk here cost today than last year? Almost close to like a dollar. In fact, nationwide, the average price of a gallon of milk jumped almost a dollar since the start of the pandemic. It's enough to make you wonder where your extra dollar is headed and whether there might be someone somewhere who's getting a dollar richer. You're not making an extra dollar. No, I'm not making any extra money. The extra dollar he's taking in, he says, goes straight to the wholesaler and eventually to places like this. When an everyday American buys milk wherever they are in the country and they're right. paying a dollar more than they were a year and a half ago. Well, if it wasn't for that, then a lot more farmers would be going out of business. Wendell Gaiman is a third generation farmer raising cows here on Marwell Dairy Farm, less than an hour from the DND market. <laughs> And while he's most definitely selling the cow's milk for more than he was, he's also pouring that extra money away. So Wendell, this is the stuff that's costing more? This is the stuff that's costing more. All because of a giant increase in the price of feed. Where was it before prices started rising and where is it today? I think it was about uh, $3,000 a month. And then it, it's now close to 4,500 or 5,000. Uh, 5, wow. Just to buy the feed. Wow. That means your extra dollar is going to cover his rising costs. So what you're saying is it, it, it's not going to get Wendell and every other dairy farmer a better pickup truck and a bigger TV. <laughs> no, I wish, but that's not how it works. Which brought us to our next stop, where your extra dollar eventually goes right into the register of a shop like this one. So Wendell says he's paying more for feed. Mm -hmm. Is that true? That's very true. Kevin Goulden is co-owner of Ole Valley Feed. You've yeah, got going up, corn, going, corn up, going up and soybeans, soybeans going, going up. up. And those are your ingredients pretty much to make feed. Using these charts and tables, Goulden explained to us that your extra dollar doesn't stay with him either. When you're looking for somebody to blame for the higher price, where do you point the finger? World economics. World economics? Oh, yeah, because this is a global market in what we do. 
But world economics is kind of an unsatisfying boogeyman here, right? Well, you know, I can't call him on the phone and complain. I can't no, write an angry you, letter. You have no one to complain to. And he's absolutely right. Inflation is such a complicated topic. It's one that economists truly do not understand all that well. Gina Smialik covers inflation for the New York Times. Where does it really begin? Who's the first person to raise the price? I think it is so difficult to talk about this because inflation is no individual person's fault, right? The government did a lot of stimulus during the pandemic and that helped to push up consumer demand, which is part of the inflation story. But when it comes to something as seemingly simple and straightforward as a gallon of milk, the story of your extra dollar only gets more complicated. So we are starting to see some improvement in the ports. Involving long-term impacts from production and delivery issues and volatile fuel prices affecting way more than just milk. Early in the pandemic, everybody wanted a new couch or a new living room set. They ordered those and the shipping routes that we all use globally to transport our goods got really clogged up. As that happened, the cost of transporting anything started to really skyrocket. It became expensive to transport feed or grain or, you know, whatever you need to make a farm operate, which ends up making the milk that you're buying today, a year and a half later, a lot more expensive because at every sort of link in this chain, we've seen prices going up and that just echoes through the supply chain. Inflation is fueling change in other industries, too. The price of used cars are skyrocketing, and car buyers are cashing in with something called car flipping. Here's Carter Evans. The rules of the road are changing. How much did you pay for that out the door with taxes? I think like 87, 600. Dennis Wang just bought a brand new Tesla five months ago, but the offer he just got from a dealer is too good to pass up. And they gave you how much? $101,000. It's absolutely insane, mind blown. The dealer paid off the rest of his loan and Wang walked away with a check for almost $17,000. In the last two years, I've been driving brand new cars and, and have not lost a cent. Eddie Gribbist flipped his car for $5,000 more than he paid for it. Nine months and this is how much it appreciated even basic vehicles like a Honda Civic or a Toyota Camry, these vehicles are worth more in the used market than they are in the new market. Typically, cars lose more than 20% of their value that first year on the road. Since the pandemic began, used car prices are actually up 53%, and that has some car owners seeing green. If we don't have enough new cars, guess what? Consumers resort to used cars, essentially raising the ceiling for what used cars cost. What does this do for a mom who's going to try and buy a used Toyota Camry? You know, it's going to be shock and awe. Now you're virtually guaranteed at every price point to pay more and get less. But some car makers are beginning to crack down. GM is now warning buyers the warranties on some of its most popular vehicles will disappear if those cars are flipped within the first 12 months. Tesla says it may unilaterally cancel any order we believe was made with a view toward resale. And that's exactly what happened to Dennis Wang's next car. My orders for Tesla's actually has been deleted. So they're really just trying to protect the customers and, of course, themselves at the end of the day. Coming up, how artwork lost over the years since Hurricane Katrina is being rediscovered. This is Eye on America. Seventeen years since Hurricane Katrina made landfall, the city of New Orleans is in some ways still recovering. Internationally renowned street artist Banksy paid tribute to the city in the aftermath of the storm with his unique installations. But they're now in need of repair, too. Jamie Wax shows us the restoration effort underway. This area of New Orleans on the eastern side was flooded earlier today after a levee bordering an industrial canal broke during the height of the storm. Nice and slow, Captain. Nice and slow. Here's a Katrina story you may not have heard. Also a 17, a tale of 17 important works of art. One, two, one, two. Internationally renowned street artist Banksy, arguably the most famous and valued living artist, 
installed multiple pieces of public art in New Orleans three years after the hurricane as a tribute to the people of the city. Though the worth of the artworks is impossible to calculate, amazingly, only a handful have survived. International House was the first World Trade Center in the world. That's in large part due to people like real estate developer Sean Cummings. It's visually interesting. You have all the different quotes. And secondly, you know, this tells the... What, what do you call this room? Is this a museum Banksy room? Banksy room. The Banksy room, okay. Who preserved and restored Banksy's looters mural for the lobby of his International House Hotel. We are in front of one of the most important Banksy's in the world that you helped restore. Yeah. and brought here to your hotel. Why was that important to you? The remarkable part of it, I think, is that one of the most famous artists in the world came to New Orleans at a time where we were down and out in the aftermath of the Katrina catastrophe. Everyone wants to matter, and I think that the 17 murals or stencils that were painted around the city, in effect, said, New Orleans matters, you matter. Before making it into the hotel lobby, the 1,600-pound looter's mural was almost lost for good. Different street artists painted over it. They put paper mache or papier mache, plexiglass, threw all kind of stuff on it, Obama election posters, whatever. And it, ultimately, it was completely opaque, concealed from the public for more than a year. People forgot that it was there. Thankfully, with the help of restoration artist Elise Grenier, a Louisiana native who's worked on restoring art at locations throughout Europe, this Banksy was saved. We had a chance to talk with Elise in front of what is Banksy's most famous work in the Big Easy, Umbrella Girl. Now, what you're doing with Banksy is similar to what you do with, with ancient art forms in Europe, is that you're trying to take them out of their original context and just preserve them. Well, we have to sometimes to protect them. Yeah. Now, Sean and Elise plan to keep on protecting New Orleans' remaining Banksy's. Next on their list is Banksy's child with a life preserver. The building where the work was created was demolished, but a dump truck driver with an eye for art saved the piece and reached out to Sean. We got a sneak peek at the restoration in a secret warehouse. You are in the process of finding other Banksy's and restoring them. Can you tell me about that? We've been fortunate to save a, another one, a second uh, of the 17. We're almost finished, maybe 30 more days, but we'll be excited to share with the public a second piece of his work that was otherwise literally lost to a landfill or a dump truck. What is it about the Banksy art that really draws you? Because I can tell talking to you, this is really a passion for you. You know, this famous artist to make a statement and effectively say, you know, this place matters, you all matter. And, uh, and still, as he always does, with smart wit, poke a finger in the eye of convention and authority in as only he can. We close our show with the story of the American dream attained. More than 2,100 people were recently sworn in as new U.S. citizens at a ceremony in a very special place, the iconic Dodger Stadium near Los Angeles. Jonathan Vigliotti takes us there. You don't have to be a fan of baseball to be moved by the Emerald Field of America's national pastime. I don't really know a lot about baseball, but I guess the Dodgers is my team now. <laughs> For 2,100 people, the hallowed ground of Dodger Stadium was turned into a fitting stage, welcoming them as new citizens. I had to wait to get all the right uh, visa and forms to come through. Uh, sorry, it's been a long time coming. Um, yeah. From Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean, Asia and Africa, young and old, they pledge their allegiance on this field of their dreams in the heart of L.A. Please raise your right hand. Among them, the oldest new American in Los Angeles today, 89-year-old Mona Lindo. I'm very excited. Sunday, too. Yeah. 
I'm very, very proud of my humble be beginning, but I really love America. Originally from Jamaica, she brought her young family to L.A. in the 80s. She says she never felt the need to become a U.S. citizen at first, but having eight children and 41 grand and great grandkids, most of whom are now American citizens, changed things. How long have you lived in the U.S. for? 42 years. 42 years? Yeah. Why did you wait until now to get, <laughs> to get your said citizenship? I said I wanted to retire in Jamaica, but it became all my family um, decided to become a citizen. So I make the decision to get my citizenship. Including her daughter, Pam. She, she realizes what's going on, you know, politically, and she wants to be a part of that process also. I hereby declare on oath. I am very inspired. She realized the importance of it and stuck through it. Seeing newly minted Americans never gets old, says United States Citizenship and Immigration Services Director Er Mendoza Jadu. It is extremely special. It has been several years since we've been able to do a big special events like, like this one and naturalize over 2,000 people from 120 countries. Congratulations. If Mona Lindo has a message for any other holdouts is that when it comes to becoming an American, it's better late than never. What's your message to people watching this now who may think, I'm too old to try something new. What do you say to those people? Well, it's never too late. I most think about living than dying. So I continue with my life wherever it takes me. This is really For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24 seven, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America. This episode of Ion America is sponsored by Amazon.